Hello and welcome to NTD News Today. Kevin Hogan here. Let's take a look at our top stories. Pandemic advisor Dr. Fauci predicts we'll see more vaccine mandates soon once the FDA approves the vaccines. But the man who invented mRNA tech vaccine technology warns that mandates could actually cause more harm than good. A top aide to New York Governor Andrew Cuomo resigns. That's while a sheriff discusses a groping complaint against him by one of his accusers who speaks out publicly for the first time. California's Dixie Fire becomes the second largest wildfire in the state's history. The fire is now 21% contained. Only the complex fire from last year was larger. The U.S. Embassy in Afghanistan is urging all Americans to get out of the country immediately as U.S. forces get set to withdraw and the Taliban takes over several regional capitals. The embassy says their resources to help Americans are limited because of the circumstances. White House pandemic advisor Dr. Anthony Fauci has a prediction about vaccine mandates. Although he says we won't see a federal mandate, he thinks there will be a flood of them at the local level once the FDA approves the vaccines. It comes as the Delta variant causes virus cases to surge in the United States. And today's Jessica Beatty has more. Dr. Anthony Fauci told NBC over the weekend he hopes the FDA will approve the CCP virus vaccines in the next few weeks. If that's the case, you're, you're going to see the empowerment of local enterprises giving mandates. That could be colleges, universities, places of business, a whole variety. And I strongly support that. Fauci told USA Today he thinks there will be a flood of vaccine mandates after the FDA approves the vaccines. Right now, they're still under emergency use. The U.S. Air Force Chief of Staff says he thinks the Pentagon will eventually mandate it. Encouraging our, our members to get vaccinated, uh, expecting that they, uh, uh, you know, uh, at some point it'll be mandated, just like we do just our normal flu shot. The second largest teachers union wants to mandate it for teachers, too. And President Biden recently approved rules requiring federal workers to provide proof of vaccination or face regular testing, mask mandates and travel restrictions. But not everyone agrees with a push for vaccine mandates, including the man who invented mRNA vaccine technology. Dr. Robert Malone argues in an article published in The Washington Times that vaccine mandates will likely prolong the most dangerous phase of the pandemic and cause more harm than good. Because of the current state of the emergency vaccines, Dr. Malone, along with Peter Navarro, write, the more people you vaccinate, the greater the number of vaccine-resistant mutations you're likely to get. The less durable the vaccines will become, ever more powerful vaccines will have to be developed, and individuals will be exposed to more and more risk. They argue that a better strategy would be to only vaccinate the most vulnerable. And for most other people, they argue there's nothing to fear, especially if they have access to a growing number of other scientifically supported treatments. We reached out to the White House and Dr. Fauci's agency for comment, but didn't immediately hear back. Jessica Beatty, NTD News. A top aide to New York Governor Andrew Cuomo, Melissa DeRosa, has resigned following the state's attorney general's report. She says the past two years have been emotionally and mentally trying for her. In her statement, DeRosa said it was her greatest honor to serve New Yorkers for the last decade. Her resignation is a significant loss for Cuomo's administration. She's been considered his most trusted advisor, and she took the national spotlight sitting next to him during his virus briefings. This while aide Brittany Camisso says Cuomo groped her breast at the governor's state residence and explains why she didn't speak out at the time. I didn't say anything this whole time. People don't understand that this is the governor of the state of New York. There are troopers that are outside of the mansion and there are some mansion staff. Those troopers that are there, they are not there to protect me. They are there to protect him. The Albany County Sheriff talks about a criminal complaint Camisso made against Cuomo. I cannot get into the nature of um, her specific allegations. At this time, obviously, we're in the very infant stages of this investigation. We have a lot of fact-finding to do. We have interviews to conduct, and it would be totally premature for me to comment on any of that. This is the first official report with law enforcement concerning Cuomo's alleged misconduct. According to the sheriff's office, Cuomo could be arrested if the DA determines he committed a crime. Cuomo has denied touching Camisso's breast, saying he would have had to lose his mind to do such a thing. All the while, records show that she was in the governor's mansion on November 16th. 
Yet in his defense, Cuomo's lawyer said the aide made the story up and pointed to phone and email logs to claim that Cuomo was surrounded by top aides that day, suggesting Camisso's story doesn't add up. That is the only date that they identified in November. And she has said repeatedly this happened in November, and they drew that conclusion. And I'm just telling you to say blaming the victim for the governor to deny what she has claimed is not victim blaming. The sheriff said he has reached out to New York's attorney general, requesting investigative material to help them move forward. The New York Assembly's Judiciary Committee announced after a meeting that they are considering whether to impeach Cuomo. About two-thirds of the state assembly have said they would vote to impeach if the governor won't resign. A simple majority vote is all that's needed. The Senate voted to advance the $1 trillion infrastructure package Saturday. It's an important procedural step forward after months of negotiations between President Biden and a bipartisan group of senators. The yeas are 67, the nays are 27, three-fifths of the senators duly chosen and sworn having voted in the affirmative. The motion is agreed to. In another rare weekend session, the U.S. Senate voted to advance a $1 trillion infrastructure package, a procedural yet important step forward after months of negotiations between President Joe Biden and a bipartisan group of senators. The vote came after an impassioned plea from Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. We can get this done the easy way or the hard way. It's in either case, the Senate will stay in session until we finish our work. It's up to my Republican colleagues how long it takes. Senators agreed to limit debate on the legislation, which represents the biggest investment in decades in America's physical infrastructure, including roads, bridges, airports, and waterways. The chamber's top Republican, Mitch McConnell, also signaled support for the bill. I hope senators can work together in a bipartisan way to get more amendments up and continue improving this important bill. Our colleagues on both sides deserve to be heard. The timing for passage remains unclear, as lawmakers prepare for possible votes on amendments and are working behind closed doors to reach an agreement that would allow the Senate to complete its work on the legislation quickly. Passage would be a major victory for Schumer, Biden, and a bipartisan group of senators who spent months crafting the package and would send the bill on to the House of Representatives. The $1.2 trillion bipartisan infrastructure bill passed a final hurdle in the Senate Sunday night. On a final vote of 68 to 29, the Senate invoked cloture, a legislative procedure which effectively ends debate on the bill. That means the vote for final passage will come after the 30-hour post-cloture time expires, which would be just after 3 a.m. Tuesday. To avoid the risk of filibuster, Democrats needed at least 10 Republican votes. As of Sunday night, they had 18, including Senate Majority Leader, Minority Leader Mitch McConnell. California's Dixie Fire is now the second largest wildfire in the state's history. It has burned almost 500,000 acres of land in Northern California. The blaze is now 21% contained. It's second only to the complex fire from August 2020. No deaths have been reported, but thousands of locals were forced to leave their homes and authorities are still looking for missing people. According to fire officials, the fire has destroyed about 400 structures so far. Almost 14,000 others are currently at risk. Pacific Gas and Electric says that its equipment might be linked to the wildfire, but refuses to take total responsibility. A judge ordered the utility company to submit a drone surveillance and description of conditions and vegetation in the area and its possible involvement in triggering a fire that merged into the Dixie Fire. Immigration and Customs Enforcement says it found this underground tunnel running from beneath a home in Mexico to California. It's 183 feet long and has electricity, ventilation, a rail system, and a hoist. What it doesn't have is an exit. It extends three feet into U.S. territory, but it's 20 feet underground with no way out on the the U.S. side. ICE says investigators believe drug traffickers had been using the tunnel. Homeland Security has a task force dedicated to investigating such tunnels. The U.S. Embassy in Afghanistan issued an alert urging all Americans to leave the country immediately amidst escalating violence. They say that given the situation, their ability to help American citizens is extremely limited. The U.S. Embassy in Afghanistan issued a security alert Saturday, telling all Americans to leave Afghanistan immediately. It says that Americans should seek available commercial flights and not rely on the government to get them out. 
The embassy says that with the reduced staff and escalating violence, their ability to help Americans is extremely limited, and they'll loan money to citizens that can't afford a plane ticket out. The alert comes as fighting escalates inside the country. Taliban forces took over four regional capitals since Friday, including Kunduz, a strategic city in northeastern Afghanistan. Afghan security forces are fighting back in some areas, and U.S. forces have carried out airstrikes in support. On Monday, Afghanistan's defense ministry said they killed 16 Taliban insurgents in Kandahar province. A spokesman for the Taliban tells Al Jazeera that they want to negotiate a peaceful settlement. The State Department says they've removed staff that don't need to be in the country, and there is a do-not-travel alert in place for Afghanistan. Military officials say U.S. troops will fully withdraw by the end of the month, and there are still a number of possible outcomes for the country after they leave. U.S. Navy SEALs were joined by other military veterans and supporters in New York over the weekend. They gathered for an annual swim to commemorate the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 terrorist attacks and to honor those who fought and died in the war on terror. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the story. Some 200 people swam across the Hudson River on Saturday to commemorate the 20-year anniversary of the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001. You know, just thinking about, you know, all the lives lost that were here, you know, and what great sacrifices that uh, we had to do as a, as a country and as a people um, to get us where we're at now. Um, you know, just taking it all in, it's very difficult to put it into words, you know. Most of the swimmers were current or former U.S. Navy SEALs, joined by other military veterans and supporters. You can't help but think about that day and, and what it meant to our country. And, you know, um, it was a tragedy. I would say the best thing that came out of 9-11 was the months after where everyone was united. And uh, I think that our country, you know, has kind of gotten away from that and could really use that unity again. The swimmers stopped twice along the way to climb aboard barges anchored outside of the Statue of Liberty in Ellis Island. There they performed 100 push-ups in honor of the American way of life and 22 pull-ups in recognition of the 22 veterans who commit suicide every day. GI Go Fund organized the event. It's important that we remember the, um, you know, the losses that many families and many people experienced. It's also important that we honor those who responded to the tragedy uh, who responded uh, their nation's call to service, and especially those who did not make it home. The event also recognizes the 10-year anniversary of Extortion 17, the 2011 shootdown of a U.S. helicopter in Afghanistan with 38 service members and crew. The event ended with participants gathered at the World Trade Center in Lower Manhattan. They placed the American flag at the 9-11 memorial there to honor the victims of 9-11 and all those who made the ultimate sacrifice in the global war on terror. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. 1,600 Americans affected by the September 11th terror attack nearly 20 years ago are asking President Biden to release the government's records. The group sent a letter to the president reminding him of a campaign promise to release documents and information about the 9-11 attack. Some have accused the government of keeping the American people in the dark about Saudi Arabia's role in supporting Osama bin Laden. They also point to the 2018 murder of Jamal Khashoggi and the December 2019 murders of U.S. service members in Pensacola, Florida, as more evidence. If Biden doesn't comply, the group asks that he not attend the 20th anniversary memorial ceremonies at Ground Zero in New York. On Friday, White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki said the president remains committed to his campaign pledge, but needs the DOJ to take the final steps. The Minnesota Supreme Court ruled last week that a state gun law doesn't violate the Second Amendment. The law requires people to get a permit to carry a gun in public. The ruling comes as Republicans fight President Biden's nomination of David Chipman to lead the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. Chipman is an anti-gun activist. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell is urging Biden to withdraw Chipman's nomination. The U.S. Supreme Court may clarify some Second Amendment issues in a case it's scheduled to hear this fall involving concealed carry licenses. And coming up, protests against the COVID vaccine health pass continue to grow. This past weekend, hundreds of thousands of people came out into the streets. Are new shoes helping Olympic athletes break records? A professor tells us footwear technology is having an impact. More soon on NTD News. If you're like most of us, 
you're probably getting fed up with the nonsense that's going on in the banking system. Did you know that top U.S. banks have recently amended their depositor terms and conditions to include the words bank failure and what's required of you in 24 hours if, or should I say when, it happens? Don't get blindsided by your bank. Call GSI Exchange today to pick up your complimentary copy of the Bank Failure Survival Guide at 866-424-2382. We'll also send you the required format to file with your bank within 24 hours of their failure, which is now required by the top banks to avoid freezing of your funds. Yes, the top banks can now freeze your money. The world is in a strange place and banks are constantly changing the rules. So stay on top of the current events that really matter by calling GSI Exchange and requesting your free guide at 866-424-2382. Secure, the true solution for your digital privacy and security. Secure is a private and secure messaging and email solution hosted in Switzerland using military-grade encryption and Swiss privacy laws, giving you true privacy. Secure is 100% private and does not collect or sell any of your personal data. Secure's Helix technology connects you securely to our Swiss servers without the need of a VPN, guaranteeing privacy and security for all your communications. Secure Messenger doesn't require your phone number or any personal data that hackers target. Chat by Invites allows you to chat privately and securely with anyone outside of your secure network without the need for others to download Secure. Secure Send offers you a private and secure way to email anyone outside of Secure. You won't find this level of privacy or security on any other email or instant messaging application. Visit secure.com. Regain and protect your privacy today. In France, protests against the COVID vaccine health pass continue to grow. This past weekend, hundreds of thousands of people came out into the streets. NTD correspondent David Vives has the details. 237,000 French people took to the streets in France on Saturday to protest against the health pass, according to Interior Minister. More than twice as much as the turnout at the first protests nearly a month ago. The health pass is a certificate that proves you're vaccinated or that you had a negative COVID test less than 48 hours before. It's now required as of Monday to enter bars, restaurants, trains, hospitals and other public venues. The pharmacy worker says she's concerned about health risks from the vaccine. She says protesting the health pass is really a fight for life. We're being pushed to get injection. This is a matter of life. And as time goes on, they want to vaccine younger children. We have many doubts toward our government, the way it managed the crisis. There is no trust. The protests were largely peaceful, with little violence toward the police. The protest seems to have no leaders, but rather to be a spontaneous grassroots movement. This police union spokesman says that the government is using policemen to check people's compliance with the health pass. Now we'll have people who are considered lesser citizens. This is lamentable. Most of my colleagues are disgusted. They will now control the people's health pass in restaurants, rather than doing their jobs arresting bad people. What happens if someone doesn't have a pass? We are told by the new law to arrest the restaurant owner. That's incredible. In South France, the protests have increased over the recent weeks. In the city of Nice, the number of demonstrators may be four times higher than last week, according to local media. We're, we're absolutely aware of uh, what is happening in the world, that France is going towards a, a, very, uh, a very dangerous path. We really see a lot of people here. This is now or never. We have to mobilize. Meanwhile, France's health minister said 45 million people have been vaccinated for COVID and that this kind of mobilization saves lives. The anti-pass protests look likely to continue, with more scheduled for next Saturday. David Vives, NTD News, Paris. Video released by military police in Italy captured an arsonist in the middle of starting a fire. The incident was caught on hidden camera in the countryside near Montesarchio, a town some 30 miles from Naples. The video showed a pixelated figure lighting a match, placing it on the grass, and running away as flames quickly grew. The man was arrested by authorities. 
With temperatures surpassing 100 degrees Fahrenheit across southern Italy, hot winds have stoked the flames of wildfires, a common sight during the country's dry and hot summers. The Italian Fire Brigade tweeted on Sunday that this year in the period between June 15th to August 8th, they've seen a 70% increase in the number of wildfire interventions. In that time, they carried out over 44,000 interventions compared to more than 26,000 during the same period of 2020. The International Olympic Committee declared the Tokyo Olympics officially closed, with officials claiming the Games were a success despite the pandemic. Tokyo capped the 2020 Olympics on Sunday with a dazzling fireworks display, a celebratory image in contrast with an event that was not the financial windfall Japan had hoped for after postponing the Games for a year due to a global health crisis. Organizers said the unprecedented event held mostly without spectators would serve as a symbol of world triumph, but while organizers appeared to prevent the Tokyo Games from spiraling into a super-spreader event, daily COVID-19 infections in the host city ballooned during the Games, spiking to more than 5,000 for the first time in Tokyo and threatening to overwhelm its hospitals. Public opinion polls showed most Japanese citizens opposed holding the games during a worldwide health crisis. In the end, Japan was saddled with a $15 billion bill, double what it initially expected, and with no tourism boom. But a record medal haul for the host nation may have helped to take out some of the sting for Japan, which won 27 gold medals. The United States finished at the top of the pack with 39 gold medals, one more than rival China at 38. U.S. television ratings for the game saw a considerable decline compared to the 2016 Olympics. NBC's primetime coverage on July 26th averaged 14.7 million viewers, which is nearly 50% drop compared to the same night during the 2016 Rio de Janeiro Olympics, and it's 53% less than the 2012 Olympics in London. The overall television audience for the Tokyo Games, according to Nielsen ratings, was down by about 45 percent compared to the Rio Games. Some have speculated that the pandemic, as well as certain Team USA athletes' embracing of woke viewpoints and some not standing for the national anthem, alienated certain viewers, which contributed to the decline in ratings. Here's a curious question. Is new footwear technology helping Olympic athletes smash records? NTD's Miguel Moreno has more from a professor who says it is. So the next question is, should they be regulated? A lot of records have been broken in Tokyo. At least three required running. Norway, for example, smashed a decades-old record in the 400-meter hurdles. Now people are asking, is footwear technology making it easier for athletes to break records? You know, you can see there the drastic difference in the thickness. Jeff Burns is a sports scientist and engineer at University of Michigan. He says shoes are making a difference. So this was a standard long-distance racing spike. So you can see it has this stiff plate on the bottom and just this thin wafer of foam. This isn't even a centimeter thick. This is, you know, seven or eight millimeters right there. This new generation of spikes with that foam and the stiff plate going through looks like that. So you can see this is the same size shoe, but thicker in the heel. And you can see right here, this plate that goes through and it continues on to the bottom. Um, but it's kind of sandwiched with a little bit underneath there. And this foam is much squishier. Burns says this sandwich plate in combination with squishier foam works wonders. And so that essentially puts this optimal surface underneath the foot of every athlete. And that speeds up their running economy. It, it costs less energy to run the same speed, or you can run faster for the same amount of energy. So should shoes be regulated at the Olympics? It's an odd question, but Burns poses an interesting situation. When an athlete breaks a record by a small amount, we can't attribute that entirely to the, you know, exceptionality of the athlete. Um, we inevitably have to qualify it with, you know, an element of the equipment. Now, this isn't to say records aren't being broken by athletes without the tech in question. Take Norway's Karsten Warhol. He smashed a record that stood for just under three decades without the magical foam, only an optimized carbon fiber plate, which Byrne says is nothing new. Miguel Moreno, NTD News. As the summer games in Tokyo began winding down, astronauts and cosmonauts aboard the International Space Station could not resist Olympics fever. 
The space station crew split into two international teams for their own Olympics competition. Team Soyuz included one astronaut from the U.S. and two cosmonauts from Russia. Team Dragon held two Americans, one Japanese, and one French astronaut. They got inspiration for their team names from what their spacecrafts are called. The athletes competed in zero-gravity events. In no handball, they tried to get a ping-pong ball past the competing team using only their breath. Synchronized floating looks a lot like synchronized swimming without water. And in gymnastics, they could hover in the air and perform gymnastics maneuvers without ever having to touch the ground. NASA did not report if any medals were awarded. Thanks for watching. At NTD, we're honored to be your source for the news. Catch us again tonight at 6.30 Eastern. In New York City, I'm Kevin Hogan. We have a new channel. Subscribe to us on YouTube at NTD News. Get the highlights of our news broadcast and the most important headlines that we curate especially for you. Don't let YouTube decide what information you get. That's your choice. YouTube is deleting our videos and cuts you off from a source of honest reporting. Make sure you don't lose access to NTD's news content and take a quick moment to subscribe to our newsletter so no matter what happens here, you'll keep your access to a trustworthy news source.